The objective of computer vision is to make computers see and interpret the world like humans and possibly even better than us. Human vision performs multiple visual tasks quite effortlessly and effectively. How is visual information processed and understood in biological systems? What is the nature of computation involved in visual tasks and how might we build machines that can see? Partial answers to these questions have been offered over several decades by researchers in the fields of biology, neuroscience, and computer science. Let's say someone across the room throws a ball at you and you catch it. This appears to be a simple task, but in reality, this is one of the most complex processes to comprehend, let alone recreate. Let us try to analyze this task step by step. First, the light rays of the ball pass through both eyes and strike on their respective retinas. The retinas do some preliminary processing before sending the visual responses through optical nerves to the brain, where the visual cortex does the heavy lifting of thorough analysis. The brain taps into its knowledge base, classifies the object and dimensions, and having predicted its path, decides to act on it by sending signals to move the hand and catch the ball. This takes place in a tiny fraction of second with almost no conscious effort and almost never fails depending upon how much prior catching practice you've had. Recreating human vision isn't just a hard problem, it's a set of them, each of which relies on the other. More formally, computer vision is concerned with the automatic extraction, analysis, and understanding of useful information from a single image or a sequence of images. It involves the development of a theoretical and algorithmic basis to achieve automatic visual understanding. It is an interdisciplinary field that works for high-level understanding from digital images or videos. Computer vision has a dual goal. From the biological science point of view, computer vision aims to come up with computational models for human visual system. From the engineering point of view, computer vision aims to build autonomous systems to perform some of the tasks which the human visual system can perform and even surpass it in many cases. Many vision tasks are related to extraction of 3D and temporal information from time-varying 2D data, or in other words, videos. Of course, the two goals are intimately related. The properties and characteristics of the human visual system often give inspiration to engineers who are designing computer vision systems. Just to give you a glimpse of the capabilities of human vision, let me show you an image for a couple of seconds and ask you a couple of questions. Although the image is highly pixelated and blurred, you were able to infer the context and key information from it. Now pay high attention to this picture I'm going to show only for a fraction of a second. Are you ready? Although the image has been flashed for a split second, you were again able to establish the context. If I show you the image for a longer duration, you can make more observations for further analysis. Historically, computer vision as a field of research has been notoriously difficult. One main reason for this complexity is that the human visual system is simply too good for many visual tasks. The computer vision systems suffer by comparison. For instance, a human can recognize faces under all kinds of variations in illumination, viewpoint, expression, etc. In most cases, we have no difficulty in recognizing a friend in a photograph taken many years ago. There appears to be no limit on how many faces we can store in our brains for future recognition. But how good is human vision? Let us have a deeper look at it. Human visual system has well-known set of shortcomings that are experienced as optical illusions, where we tend to misjudge size, color, and movement. The optical illusions provide insight into the nature of the visual system and our perception. In this image, the orange circle to the left appears smaller than the orange circle to the right. But if you look closely, they both are of the same size. This illusion reveals that our brain makes judgments about the size using adjacent objects. Now look at this image closely and see if the horizontal lines in this image are of the same size. As you can see, 
it is the arrows at the each end that are tricking our brain into thinking that the lines are smaller or larger. This is the famous Ames room, which is a distorted room that creates an optical illusion. By looking at this image, you can see that the person to the left is standing way behind than the person to the right, and hence appears really small. By the way, have you followed this internet sensation, hashtag the dress? This literally split the internet into two groups where the viewers disagreed over whether the dress picture was colored black and blue or white and gold. What do you see? The phenomenon revealed differences in human color perception, which have been the subject of ongoing scientific investigations into neuroscience and vision science. Computer vision is transitioning from a nascent stage and is proving to be incredibly useful in several application areas. It's in our smartphone cameras, which are able to recognize faces and smiles. It's in self-driving cars, reading traffic signs, and watching for pedestrians. It's in factory robots monitoring for problems and navigating around human co-workers. This is just the beginning. There's still a long way to go, and that is why computer vision is a very exciting and a relevant research area to be part of. We are living in a 3D world, many. So it's a 3D physical world we're living. Um, computer vision is very critical in the sense that if you want to understand our physical world, 3D world, and also to interact with our 3D world. So it's very important to, for, to teach the computer to see and understand the world as a human being. So that's, in this sense, computer vision is really important because human relies on our eyes a lot to achieve our daily activities, to achieve many tasks. So if the machine can do the same, achieve the same capability, well, computer vision techniques, that'll be great. The field of computer vision heavily incorporates concepts from the areas of digital signal processing, neuroscience, and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence and computer vision share topics such as pattern recognition and machine learning. Consequently, computer vision is sometimes seen as a part of the artificial intelligence field or the computer science field in general. Much of the latest developments are fueled by the advances in the field of computer architecture and software engineering. Also, many of the computer vision topics can be studied from a purely mathematical point of view. For example, many methods in computer vision are based on statistics, optimization, or geometry. In order to cover the full spectrum of areas related to computer vision, let us look at the computer vision pipeline, which starts with image acquisition. Solid state physics is a field closely related to computer vision. Most computer vision systems rely on image sensors, which detect electromagnetic radiation, typically in the form of visible or infrared light. The process by which light interacts with surfaces is explained using physics, which also explains the behavior of optics, a core part of most imaging systems. In general, the image acquisition devices of computer vision systems capture visual information as digital signals and hence the need for digital signal processing techniques. Many methods for processing one variable signals, typically temporal signals, can be extended to processing visual data which comprises of two variable or multivariable signals. However, because of the specific nature of images, there are many methods developed within computer vision which have no counterpart in processing of one variable signals. This makes digital image processing a distinct field. The field of digital image processing predominantly deals with image-to-image -image transformations. Typical image processing operations include image compression, image restoration, and image enhancement. Computer vision systems rely on image processing techniques to pre-process the image data for robust high-level analysis. The robust high-level analysis is the next major task in computer vision pipeline. It is the area where neuroscience plays an important role, specifically the study of the biological vision system. Over the last century, there has been an extensive study of eyes, neurons, and brain structures devoted to processing of visual stimuli in both humans and various animals. 
This has led to a coarse yet complicated description of how real vision systems operate in order to solve certain vision-related tasks. These results have led to a subfield within computer vision where artificial systems are designed to mimic the processing and behavior of biological systems at different levels of complexity. Interdisciplinary exchange between biological and computer vision has proven fruitful for both fields. Computer vision has an overlap with the field of computer graphics as well. Computer graphics studies the techniques that produce image data from 3D models, whereas computer vision works to produce 3D models from image data. Which of these two problems is the most difficult to solve? Machine vision is the process of applying a range of technologies and methods to provide imaging-based automatic inspection, process control, and robot guidance in industrial applications. The external conditions such as lighting are often more controlled in machine vision than they are in general computer vision. This can enable the development of a special class of vision algorithms. Photogrammetry also has an overlap with the field of computer vision. Photogrammetry is the science of making measurements from photographs, especially for recovering the exact positions of surface points captured in the images. Photogrammetry is as old as modern photography, dating to the mid-19th century. To summarize, let us look at an infographic that shows the related areas of computer vision in a holistic way. Computer vision is a, is a new subject, it's not a new subject, so it's a subject um, come from artificial intelligence. Right? So it was one of the sub areas of artificial intelligence. Uh, it is relevant to image processing, um, machine learning, robotics, graphics, and uh, um, cognitive science, neuroscience, um, among others, right? So it, it has a broad uh, connections to many of the areas. Just imagine uh, how our human eyes are working. It's just uh, not, the, the eyes are working just not to rely on the eyes, but also the brain functions. The brain has many connections to other parts of your senses, ears, other places as well. So there's a lot of uh, things we can work on. Program languages uh, we use often use C plus plus C Python, uh, MATLAB. Uh, we have a lot. The good news for the beginners now is that compared with uh, ten years, more than ten years before when I doing my PhD, the really good news now is that we have a lot of available toolbox. If you just want to try them to see the results, it's much much easier than before. Which when I when I first go in computer vision, I have to write from the scratch, the first line of the code until after maybe three months later or even longer, I can see the result. Now, if you if you if you know how to utilize those toolbox within one week, you get familiar with the toolbox. Some sometimes people even get faster. You can see the results immediately. Okay, that's we have a lot of toolbox in, for example, OpenCV. That's a classic toolbox for vision, and many others, including deep learning uh, toolboxes. They have a huge number of them we can utilize. In many industries, people are, just haven't become aware that this is possible because computer vision's been around for decades, but for almost the entirety of that history, it's been a prohibitively expensive and complicated technology. So, for example, I took one computer vision class in graduate school, and I sort of filed computer vision next to nuclear fusion after that, like, well, that's a really amazing technology, it's so powerful, too bad it's so expensive and complicated that I'll never use it. Well, I would say most engineers working in industry today probably think, still think of computer vision that way. So first people have to become aware, oh wait, it's not just for NASA anymore, this is now in mobile phones, even in toys, this could go into almost anything. Then once they're aware, they have to learn how to use the technology. There aren't so many engineers in industry that know how to use the technology. 
because industry hasn't used the technology very much until very recently. It's mainly been in a few niche applications like industrial inspection. So there needs to be a, um, we need to raise awareness that this is now a technology that's ready for the mainstream, can be incorporated into almost any type of system. Then we need engineers to get the skills to understand not everyone needs a PhD in computer vision, but tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of engineers need to know enough about computer vision to have an intelligent conversation with the PhD and figure out, do I need this algorithm or that? Do I need this sensor or that? What's feasible and how would I integrate this um, visual perception capability into my product? So I think those are, those are really the two biggest obstacles, more so than the technological obstacles. Technological obstacles are collapsing very fast, um, but the, the awareness and education, you know, people change slower than technology. To understand where we are today in the field of computer vision, it is important to know the history and the key milestones that shaped this rapidly evolving field. The field of computer vision emerged in the 1950s with research along three distinct lines, replicating the eye, replicating the visual cortex, and replicating the rest of the brain. These are cited in order according to their level of difficulty. One early breakthrough came in 1957 in the form of the perceptron machine. The giant machine thickly tangled with wires was the invention of psychologist and computer vision pioneer Frank Rosenblatt. And then the same year marked the birth of the pixel. In the spring of 1957, the National Bureau of Standards scientist Russell Kirsch took a photo of his son, Walden, and scanned it into the computer. To fit the image into the computer's limited memory, he divided the picture into a grid. This five centimeter square photo was the first digital image ever created. In 1963, MIT graduate student Larry Roberts submitted a PhD thesis outlining how machines can preserve solid three-dimensional objects by breaking them down into simple two-dimensional figures. Roberts' block world provided the basis for future computer vision research. Another key moment in the field of computer vision was the founding of the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. One of the co-founders was Marvin Minsky, who famously instructed a graduate student in 1966 to connect a camera to a computer and have it describe what it sees as a summer project. Fast forward 50 years, and we are still working on it. Around the time ARPANET went live in the fall of 1969, Bell Labs scientists Willard Boyle and George Smith were busy inventing the charge-coupled device, the CCD, which converted photons into electrical impulses quickly became the preferred technology for capturing high-quality digital images. In October 2009, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in physics for their invention. The 70s saw the first commercial applications of computer vision technology, which is Optical Character Recognition, or OCR. Studies in the 1970s formed the early foundations for many of the computer vision algorithms that exist today, including extraction of edges from images, labeling of lines, modeling and representation of objects as interconnections of smaller structures, optical flow, and motion estimation. The first commercial digital camera appeared in 1975. The next decade saw studies based on more rigorous mathematical analysis and quantitative aspects of computer vision. By the 1990s, research in projective 3D reconstructions led to better understanding of camera calibration. This evolved to methods of sparse 3D reconstructions of scenes from multiple images. Progress was being made in the field of stereo imaging and multi-view stereo techniques. At the same time, variations of graph cut algorithms were used to solve image segmentation, which enabled higher level interpretation of the coherent regions of images. This decade also marked the first time statistical learning techniques were used in practice to recognize faces. Toward the end of 1990s, a significant change came about with the increased interaction between the fields of computer graphics and computer vision. This included image-based rendering, image morphing, view interpolation, 
panoramic image stitching, and early light field rendering. In 2001, two computer scientists, Paul Viola and Michael Jones, triggered a revolution in the field of face detection, which brought computer vision into the spotlight. Later, the face detection framework was successfully incorporated in digital cameras. In 2004, David Lowe published the famous scale invariant feature transform, which is the breakthrough solution to the correspondence problem. Neural networks got their game on in 2005, where training them was made multiple times faster, much cheaper, and more accurate by using off-the-shelf GPUs popularly used in gaming consoles. Progress in the field of computer vision accelerated further due to the internet, thanks to the larger annotated datasets of images becoming available online. The datasets helped drive the field forward by proposing difficult challenges. They also contributed to the rapid growth in importance of learning methods, and they help benchmark and rank computer vision techniques. The ImageNet project started in 2009, which is a large visual database designed for use in visual object recognition software research. Since 2010, the ImageNet large-scale visual challenge has pitted people against computers to see who does a better job of identifying images. It is not an exaggeration to say that the artificial intelligence boom we see today could be attributed to a single event, the announcement of the 2012 ImageNet Challenge results. A research team from University of Toronto submitted a deep convolutional neural network architecture called AlexNet, still used in research to this day, which bet the state of the art back then by a whopping 10.8 percentage point margin. Convolutional neural networks later became the neural network of choice for many data scientists, as it requires very little pre-programming compared to other image processing algorithms. In the last few years, CNNs have been successfully applied to identify faces, objects, and traffic signs, as well as powering vision in robots and self-driving cars. In 2014, a team of researchers at the University of Montreal introduced the idea that machines can learn faster by having two neural networks compete against each other. One network attempts to generate fake data that looks like the real thing, and the other network tries to discriminate the fake from the real. Over time, both networks improve. The generator produces data so real that the discriminator can't tell the difference. Generative adversarial networks are considered a significant breakthrough in computer vision in the past few years. In 2015, Facebook announced that the DeepFace facial recognition algorithm identifies the correct person 97.35% of the time, putting it more or less on par with humans. While computer vision was barely mentioned in the news before 2015, the news coverage about the topic grew by more than 500% since then. Today, we see computer vision-related news in the media quite often. Let us have a look at few media articles in the recent times. Learning from others um, is, is a great experience for myself. Uh, for computer vision, it's actually um, across many fields, including image processing, pattern recognition, mach machine learning, robotics, and other things. Because uh, for, to make the machine can see, we need to understand the context as well. So I, I did learn a lot from my colleagues, uh, my previous uh, supervisors, advisors, and including my own students. We're 
very excited to see the field of computer vision pro is, is, is progressing extremely fast, particularly in the past five years. So this is also um, is contributed by the people from different areas. Computer vision is interacting with uh, both with subjects in computer science and outside. Yeah, for example, if you talk about image processing, that's more like a traditionally electrical engineering uh, subject. But they also um, help computer vision and computer vision help uh, image processing. They, they, they influence each other. And it starts to merge to new directions as well. Today is an exciting time to work on computer vision as it is becoming an integral technology in our daily lives. Applications of computer vision range from tasks such as industrial vision systems, say inspect bottles speeding by on a production line, to robots that can comprehend the world around them. Computer vision is outperforming humans on certain real world tasks such as circuit board inspections and face recognition under controlled conditions. There has also been great progress in traditional application areas like multimedia, robotics, and medical imaging. Moreover, new application areas keep arising, such as augmented reality, autonomous driving, Internet of Things, human-computer interaction, and vision for the blind. There are growing opportunities for computer vision to provide outreach to non-traditional areas, such as astronomy, nanotechnology, novel brain imaging techniques, scientific analysis, and many more. In healthcare, computer vision has the potential to reap real value. While computers won't completely replace healthcare personnel, there is a good possibility they will complement routine diagnostics that require a lot of time and expertise of human physicians. In reality, recent advances in the field of computer vision are enabling vision algorithms to surpass human vision capabilities. There are many kinds of computer vision systems. Nevertheless, all of them contain these basic elements. A power source, at least one camera, a processor, as well as control and communication cables, or some kind of wireless interconnection mechanism. In addition, a practical vision system contains configurable software, as well as a display in order to monitor the system. A class of moving cameras are egocentric vision systems, composed of a wearable camera that automatically takes pictures from the first-person perspective, like the GoPro cameras. The demand for fast and robust processing of vision tasks is so high that vision processing units are emerging as a new class of processors to complement CPUs and GPUs, which are graphics processing units. One of the key applications of computer vision is visual surveillance. Human supervision simply cannot scale up to the needs of visual surveillance. There are too many objects and events to keep track of. Visual surveillance is an active area of research. You know, to make it work robustly on an energy constrained system like a drone. The next major computer vision application area is biometrics. The most widely used biometric application is fingerprint based identification and authentication. Like shown in many movies, iris based recognition is a popular biometric application. Iris recognition was used in 2002 to identify the woman in this emblematic National Geographic cover image from 1985. Face recognition is also a widely used computer vision based biometric application. Most of the smartphones these days have face unlock feature. All right, so computer vision in multimedia and entertainment. If you have ever used face filters, or played augmented reality based games, you have experienced computer vision powered applications in first hand. Speaking of multimedia applications, majority of the image processing applications have a computer vision aspect to them. To fit an image into screens of different aspect ratios is not a trivial problem because cropping and scaling wouldn't work. Image retargeting is one of the sophisticated image processing applications 
which uses the seam carving to retain the salient regions in the image. And of course, visual effects is one of the areas where computer vision is widely used. Computer vision is indispensable when it comes to navigation. Stereo vision and depth sensor based vision are widely used for robot navigation systems. One of the popular features of Google navigation app is Google Street View, created by using panorama stitching. When it comes to autonomous driving, computer vision plays a very crucial role. For instance, have a look at this lane detection system, which keeps the vehicle in the designated lane. A complete scene understanding is the basic requirement for autonomous driving vehicle. Automated supermarkets is one of the latest trends that is powered by computer vision. Visual search on smartphone cameras gives the user a rich set of information related to the object of interest, be it the name of that house plant or the product that you want to buy or even a landmark. Now let's look at computer vision applications in industry. Seeing AI is a Microsoft research project for people with visual impairments. The app narrates the world around you by turning the visual world into an audible experience. Point your phone's camera, select a channel, and hear a description. The app recognizes saved friends. Jenny near top right, three feet away. Describes the people around you, including their emotions. 28-year-old female wearing glasses looking happy. It reads text out loud as it comes into view, like on an envelope, Ken Lawrence, P.O. Box, or a room entrance, Conference 2005, or scan and read documents like books and letters. The app will guide you and recognize the text with its formatting. Top and left edge is not visible. Hold steady. Lease agreement. This agreement. When paying with cash, the app identifies currency bills. 20 U.S. dollars. When looking for something in your pantry or at the store, Use the barcode scanner with audio cues to help you find what you want. Campbell's tomato soup. When available, hear additional product details. Heat and microwave bowl on height. And even hear descriptions of images in other apps like Twitter by importing them into Seeing AI. A close-up of Bill Gates. Finally, explore our experimental features like scene descriptions to get a glimpse of the future. I think it's a young girl throwing a frisbee in the park. Experience the world around you with the Seeing AI app from Microsoft. Applications of computer vision image processing range from, um, for example, automation. So to make the machine can see, so the machine can automatically achieve certain tasks. This includes uh, not only autonomous cars, but also robots. Imagine the robot UA, UAV, those uh, flying, flying robots. 
um, unmanned, uh, unmanned vehicles, um, and also uh, entertainment. That's the area uh, people may or may not realize. Actually, computer vision and image processing already big, uh, play, a, play a big part there. For example, in mobile phone, there are many functionalities when you take a picture can make you f look better, to beautify your face, to change the, the color tone of the scene. So it's really, really cool. I use it every day, right? So for entertainment, people can make the pictures better. That's for image processing, cater to your needs. Medical, uh, that's another uh, very big potential applications for computer vision and image processing. So nowadays we use, uh, uh, we have a much, much more medical data in the hospitals than before because of the, the imaging equipment you now is, is cheaper and more extensively used. So there are a huge amount of the medical image data there in the, in the hospital. Can we use computer vision image processing to help the doctors analyze at least partially of those uh, medical data? So that would be very much helpful. Um, other areas like industry, of course, automation, I mentioned that already in for industry, um, Automation, yeah, so entertainment. The progress of computer vision in the past five years is extremely fast to, to the extent where it's, it's out of the expect, expectations of many experts, I believe. Um, so its impacts uh, in our daily lives are also tremendous. And give you some examples. For example, we heard about autonomous cars, autonomous driving. Uh, we can use cameras to look at the um, road in the highway, for example, and the camera can see the, the, the lanes, other vehicles, um, or even pedestrians if it's not in the highway, and can automatically detect them and help you drive the car in a better, better way, or even fully automatically drive the car, which is the final goal of autonomous driving. So autonomous cars, we've seen them already. That's the uh, beneficial of computer vision techniques. Um, and also, if you see uh, facial recognition, that's another um, topic in computer vision which grows extremely fast. Uh, now we can use your face to, for example, unlock your mobile phone. You don't have to use a password, you can just look at the mobile phone, and the mobile phone recognize your face and it directly go into the system. And even you can, in Asia, people even, even using a uh, facial to pay to, for example, you do not have to input your password, just look at the camera, camera recognizes you, and you can do online payment. Um, those kind of application are really cool. Imagine so many uh, faces uh, will have to differentiate. And also in surveillance systems, yeah, people use this to um, recognize people, detect people. Nowadays, uh, for example, I worked in Singapore before. Uh, so in Singapore, there are many, uh, Singapore is a safe city, there are many cameras there. Um, uh, in China uh, as well. So people use uh, surveillance cameras to monitor, uh, uh, to capture faces, for example. And then if you are a crime people, you're registered. You, you, you're the one of the most wanted, most wanted list. And then if, the, if you happen to appear in one of the cameras, and if the camera recognizes that's the one, so it can alarm the police, and the police can know some, someone in the most wanted list is there. So it did happen that some of them are captured in this way. Vision is a, a very complete, uh, very important uh, technique for augmented reality. Uh, augmented reality, for example, if you play with uh, um, Microsoft uh, HoloLens, so for example, it can give you, uh, on top of the real scene you see, it can give you virtual information, stuff. For example, um, if you wear the, the augmented reality glass, the Google Glass, this, if you heard about the Google Glass, of course now it disappeared, but if you heard about the Google Glass before, that's kind of the concept for augmented uh, reality. So vision is important because if you want to put anything on that makes sense to the real scene, you have to understand it first. For example, if you take the, if you, if you glass, see a building, you, if you want to make an augmented reality so that you can attach information of that building, so this is a building built in 
100 years ago and has a very nice restaurant there, so on and so forth, so forth information. We have to first understand, identify which building it is. So you may rely on computer vision, object recognition, detection, segmentation to know what, what you see. That's the first step. Whenever you know, computer vision can tell you what you see through the camera, then it can augmented reality can function by putting even more information there or help you interact with the real world better. So vision is a very important uh, task there. So myself also partially work on this in the sense that we want to human hands to help you to interact in your real or virtual scenario. So we want to the camera, when you put the, the hand in on top of the camera, the camera should understand what's your hand's motion. For example, if you can manipulate any object there, you can do that. Images cannot exist without light. To produce an image, the scene must be illuminated with one or more light sources. In general terms, light sources can be divided into point and area light sources. A point light source originates at a single location in a three-dimensional space, like a small light bulb, or potentially at infinity, like the sun. In addition to that, Light sources have a range of intensities and a spectrum of wavelengths, which influences the design of imaging systems. Machine vision, which deals with vision tasks in control setting, capitalizes on the principles of lighting. Recognizing and understanding the importance of illumination can lead to the simpler, easier, and less costly solutions. In an image, the key factors that affect the color of a pixel are the light sources and object surface properties, their emittance and reflectance spectrum, and their relative position and orientation. Most of the computer vision systems assume a local illumination model with no interreflections nor scattering. A correct illumination model needs to consider the interreflections as well. However, it is quite difficult to analyze a scene by such a complex model. Let us look at the basic concepts of light, reflectance, and shading in much more detail. In general, the word light refers to the visible spectrum of the electromagnetic radiation. Visible light spans the wavelengths between 400 to 700 nanometers, which is a very minute fraction of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. The appearance of light sources depends on their spectral power distribution which shows the relative intensity of light across the wavelengths. Different light sources have different power spectrums, which influence the design of imaging systems and how objects appear in the images. Light is measured using several techniques and the terminology can be a little overwhelming. For now, we'll be focusing on radiometric techniques. Radiometric measurements at the light source are represented as radiance or luminance. If the radiometric measurements are made at the object surface, they are represented as irradiance or illuminance. Depending on the direction of the light source, the shape and reflectance properties of the object, different configurations of shadows and shading are observed. When light hits an object, it gives rise to different scenarios. Either it gets transmitted through, or it gets absorbed, or it gets reflected. Let us consider the simplest case of all, reflection. Given the surface normal, the angle of incidence is always equals to the angle of reflection. Majority of the surfaces in the real world have both diffuse reflection as well as specular reflection component. Irrespective of the direction of the incident light, diffuse reflection happens in almost every direction. Now, let us try to formalize this reflection model by considering this figure. We have the incoming ray, the incident ray, which is defined by a theta and phi, as well as 
we have the reflected ray or the outgoing ray defined by theta and phi as well. This kind of formulation makes sense considering the reflected ray can be in any direction. So the theta and phi are going to capture those directions for us. Given an incoming ray and outgoing ray, what proportion of the incoming light is reflected along outgoing ray? This answer is given by bidirectional reflection distribution function, which is represented as a function of theta i, phi i, theta e, and phi e. Here are a few facts about bidirectional reflection distribution function. The first one is outgoing light energy is less than or equal to incident light energy. And reversing the incident light direction results in the same reflectance. We are going to stick with this convention where we have unit vector L pointing to the light source direction, unit vector N, which is the surface normal, R corresponding to the angle of incidence, and V, which is the viewing direction. Now let's see what happens if we consider a mirror surface. The incident light will be equal to the reflected light provided viewing direction corresponds to the unit vector r. Now let us look at the other extreme which is a Lambertian surface which diffuses the incident light in all the directions. The micro facets on the Lambertian surface scatter incoming light randomly in all the directions. Now you may be wondering how does the angle of incidence matter when it comes to diffuse reflection? It does matter. The reflected light is maximum when the angle of incidence is parallel to the surface normal. Now let us try to formally define the diffuse reflection model by considering the angle of incidence theta into account. In this equation, which relates outgoing and incoming radiance, you have to observe that the constant Kd is the albedo of the surface, and n dot l is the dot product of the unit vectors n and l, which equals to cos theta. Now the bidirectional radiance distribution function for a Lambertian surface is Kd cos theta. When theta i equals to zero, the BRDF is equals to the albedo. Albedo is the proportion of the incident light or radiation that is reflected by a surface, typically that of a planet or a moon. A random fact in the middle of the lecture, Earth's albedo is around 0.3. The albedo value may vary with the variation in the wavelength of the incident light. Given the light sources have several wavelengths, it's an important factor to consider. Now let's look at the next specular surfaces, which are not exactly like mirrors, but they do have a specular component to them. Now the specular component is very high when the viewing angle is close to the unit vector R. Now not just this, we do have ambient light that we have to take into consideration as well. So this is the holistic illumination model, which takes ambient light, diffuse reflection, as well as specular reflection into account. Just to show you how these three components can be separated, this is a visualization of ambient, diffuse, and specular reflection, popularly known as Fong reflection. Light and reflectance properties can be used to estimate the shape of an object. A clear understanding of the scene illumination and the surface properties will let you develop vision. augmented reality applications which are very photorealistic. If you get a chance, check out LightStage, which is an application of light reflectance and shading. The counterpart for the human eye in computer vision is a camera. There are many variants of a camera which differ in the lens configurations and image sensors. The most basic camera model 
is a pinhole camera model. In this model, conceptually, all light passes through a vanishingly small pinhole placed at the origin and illuminates an image plane beneath it. The images formed on the image plane follow the laws of projective geometry. When using a pinhole camera model, this geometric mapping from 3D to 2D is called as perspective projection. Clearly, we are losing the depth dimension of the scene in this projected 2D images. Human vision evolved significantly to identify several cues from the 2D images to perceive depth from a single image. Perspective projection makes parallel lines in the real world appear that they might be converging. The point of convergence is called as vanishing point. Vanishing points play an important role in deciphering the planar structure of the scene as well as the relative depth. To simplify camera projections, weak perspective, affine, and orthographic camera models are explored. Before we venture into the concepts of projective geometry, let us look at the motivation for using homogeneous coordinate system. Homogeneous coordinate representation is very useful when dealing with common vector operations such as translation, rotation, scaling, and perspective projection. Let us consider this simple camera setup where we have the image plane at z equals to one and we have a ray that is intersecting the plane at x comma y. Now any point on this ray will be mapped onto that particular point on the image plane. So all the points on the ray map to a single point on the plane, which means if we have an arbitrary 3D point x, y, z, it is going to be mapped to a location x by z comma y by z comma one. Now this gives rise to an interesting correspondence where take an example of one comma three, the homogeneous coordinates for one comma three are one comma three comma one, two comma six comma two, and so on and so forth. As all the points on the ray correspond to a single point on the image, you can create visual art which capitalizes on that concept. Look at this art piece where you have these connecting lines which are actually in the 3D space, whereas the geometric figures are painted on the wall. It's interesting what you can achieve by the usage of perspective projection. To understand perspective projection in depth, let us examine the pinhole camera model. Here, we have a pinhole and we have the image plane. By definition, the distance between the pinhole and the image plane is the focal length. The light rays from the 3D objects in the real world pass through the pinhole and the image forms inverted. For the sake of mathematical convenience, we use virtual image plane, which is exactly placed at the focal length distance from the pinhole, but in front of the pinhole camera. Let us simplify this setup to the pinhole and the image plane and derive perspective projection equations. This is the camera coordinate system, where Z is the optic axis and image plane is located at a distance F. And now this is the world coordinate system. Now you may wonder, why can't we make the camera coordinate system the world coordinate system? Uh, well, you should have a reference frame if you would like to add more cameras to this setup. Anyways, let's move on with this particular setup where we have the camera coordinate system and world coordinate system. And if we go a little further, we have the image coordinate system. As you can see, we just have two dimensions to it, X and Y. The image coordinate system axes are continuous because our image is gonna be digital, we need digital image coordinate system, which is discrete. The values of u and v are gonna be integers. This is actually forward projection, which is used in the field of computer graphics. Given a real world point x, y, z, the point in the camera coordinate system is gonna be x, c, y, c, and z, c. And the same point when imaged on the image plane, it's gonna be x, y. And finally, when it is discretized, you're gonna end up with the coordinates u comma v. 
Now, a challenging problem would be backward projection, where you have a bunch of digital images through which you have to get the image plane, camera coordinates, as well as the world coordinates of the objects. Now, computer vision deals with this problem. For a start, we look at the forward projection of camera coordinates to image plane coordinates using this simple setup. In this simplified camera model, the world coordinate system as well as the camera coordinate system are the same. That is why I don't have a separate coordinate axis for the camera. Anyways, let us consider this point XYZ in the real world, which is imaged at the location X, Y, F on the image plane. Now let us pause here for a moment and validate our claim. The distance between the camera origin and the image plane is focal length F, which is in the Z axis direction. So that's why we have the Z coordinate as F along with the small x and y coordinates. This graphic has a lot going on in it. Let me break it down to you step by step. The homogeneous coordinates of x, y, z are x by z, comma y by z, comma 1. Similarly, for x, y, f, you have x by f, comma y by f, comma 1. As both these coordinates are on the same ray, you can have these equations x by f equals to x by z. Another way to prove is by using similar triangles rule. The highlighted right angle triangle is similar to this bigger right angle triangle. Okay, so x by f equals to capital X by z. Similarly, we can prove for y by f as well. Now that you're convinced that these equations are correct, we're going to rewrite them to have perspective projection equations. The x and y coordinates are scaled by the depth z. Here is an example that shows perspective projection in action. Those two highlighted regions are of the same length in the physical world, but in the image, Clearly, those distances are scaled based on the depth dimension. Orthographic projection is an assumption few computer vision applications make, but it's way too unrealistic. You'll have to have an image plane that is of the same size as the object to be able to get the orthographic projection. The next model worth paying attention to is weak perspective projection. If you ever try to take a picture by zooming your camera way too far, you would have witnessed the weak perspective projection. In weak perspective projection, the distance of the objects from the camera is very large when compared to the distance between them. So we can rewrite the perspective projection equations this way and that's gonna preserve the relative depth ratio. Reinventing the eye is the area where we've had the most success in the field of computer vision. Over the past few decades, we have created sensors and image processors that match and in some ways exceed the capabilities of the human eyes. With larger, more optically perfect lenses, and semiconductor pixels fabricated at nanometer scales, the precision and sensitivity of modern cameras is nothing short of incredible. After starting from one or more light sources, reflecting off one or more surfaces in the world, and passing through the camera's optics, light finally reaches the imaging sensor. How are the photons from the light sources arriving in the sensor converted into the digital RGB values? that we observe in the digital image. We need to develop a simple model that accounts for the most important effects such as exposure, nonlinear mappings, sampling, aliasing, and noise associated with the cameras. Once the light from a scene reaches the camera, it must still pass through the lens before reaching the sensor. 
For many applications, it suffices to treat the lens as an ideal pinhole that simply projects all rays through a common center of projection. However, if we want to deal with the issues such as focus, exposure, vignetting, or aberration, we must develop a more sophisticated model, which is where the study of optics comes in. Light falling on an imaging sensor is usually picked up by an active sensing area integrated for the duration of the exposure. This is usually expressed as the shutter speed. The two main kinds of sensors that are used in still and video cameras today are charge coupled devices, or CCD, and complementary metal oxide on silicon, or CMOS. In CCD, photons are accumulated in each active well during the exposure time. The main factors affecting the performance of digital image sensors are shutter speed, sampling pitch, chip size, analog gain, sensor noise, and the quality of analog to digital converter. Let us look at these factors in more detail. Here is the digital imaging pipeline where the object is illuminated and is captured using a digital camera and then there is some kind of post-processing. But our main focus will be on the digital camera. The key components of a digital camera are optics and the imaging sensor as well as the image processors. Moving away from the simple pinhole camera model, digital cameras are equipped with sophisticated lens optics. Hence, it is important for us to take them into account in understanding digital images. Here is a visual that shows chromatic aberration caused by a lens, which needs to be accounted for. Vignetting is another effect caused by the lens optics, which needs to be compensated for. Light, after passing through the optics, hits the imaging sensor. Photoelectric effect is the principle behind digital imaging. Intensity at an image pixel is dependent on several factors. One of the main factors being exposure time or shutter speed. It is also dependent on the quantum efficiency of the photosensor. As you can see, smaller sensor pixels saturate faster than the larger sensor pixels. Hence, we are going to list the pixel size, chip size, as well as the sampling pitch as the factors that affect the intensity at an image pixel. And finally, noise is the integral part of any imaging process. Short noise and dark noise are a few key factors that affect the intensity at an image pixel. Let us look at the digital camera pipeline. We have discussed optics, so light travels through the optics and it is controlled by the aperture you know, the size of the aperture decides how much light enters and the shutter decides the exposure time, the time for which the image sensor is exposed to the light. And finally, light reaches the sensor. This is just the tip of the iceberg in the digital camera pipeline. There, there is a huge lineup of processes that have to take place before you get to save the key processes we are going to explore are gain, demosaicing, denoising, white balance, gamma correction, and compression. All these processes are going to be covered in much more detail later on. But think about, but just think about the progress that has been made in digital imaging. Just with a click of a button, all these processes happen and finally you see the image saved on your camera. The visible spectrum occupies a very small part of the overall electromagnetic spectrum. In the course of evolution, our vision is optimized for receiving the dominant wavelengths our sun emits. 
The retina of human eye has two types of photoreceptors, rods and cones. Rods are sensitive to light intensity while cones are color sensitive. When incoming light hits an imaging sensor, light from different parts of the spectrum is integrated into the discrete red, green, and blue color values that we see in the digital image. You probably recall from your childhood days the magical process of mixing paint colors to obtain blended new ones. For example, adding blue with yellow makes green. The additive primary colors, red, green, and blue, can be mixed to make all the other colors in the color spectrum. Let us look at the color theory and how it can be useful for computer vision applications in more detail. The world as we see it is full of colored objects. Colors are an integral part of our visual perception and often used for recognizing objects. Colors of nature have been an inspiration for art and artists throughout the history. But color is not a primary physical property. Color, as we see it, is just a perception, which depends on the physical properties of the objects and the light that illuminates them. So to understand color, we have to understand our own visual system. Our eyes consist of a region called as fovea, where the concentration of the photoreceptors is dense. Foveal vision refers to the center of the field of vision where visual acuity is at its highest. That is why we tend to move our eyes when we are reading or while we are driving. The photoreceptors consist of rods and cones, of which the cones are responsible for color perception. Cone cells can be classified into three categories based on the wavelengths they are more responsive to. The cone cells are labeled as LMS, which are responsive to red, green, and blue wavelengths respectively. The absence of a specific type of cone cells is going to result in color blindedness. This is the underlying principle behind the trichromatic theory proposed in the 19th century. The theory states any color in the visible spectrum can be replicated using just three primary colors. Trichromacy is the working principle of television and the screen that you're looking into right now. This also inspired the color photography in the early 20th century. If we were to replicate this in our digital cameras, we would need a mechanism which can split the incoming light into red, green, and blue channels and project them onto their respective image sensors. But this is not how color images are captured in digital cameras. Digital cameras use color filter arrays, which differ from one camera to the other, but the underlying principle is the same. They use at least three color filters to capture the color images. The incoming light is filtered, only a set of wavelengths are allowed to hit those specific pixels on the image sensor. The obtained image is in raw format and it needs to be demosaiced to get the color image. The demosaicing is done using interpolation techniques. And then we'll have the separate RGB color channels which finally constitute the color image. Each pixel location in an RGB color image contains three intensity values. Before we proceed any further, we have to understand the difference between additive mixing and subtractive mixing of colors. Additive mixing comes into action when we are dealing with light sources. When red, green, and blue colored lights are put together, we can recreate most of the colors in the visible spectrum. And that is the working principle of your television screen. Subtractive mixing comes into action when you're not dealing with light sources, rather you're dealing with colored pigments. Subtractive mixing is the working principle of printing industry. 
where cyan, magenta, yellow are used to create all the spectrum of colors that we see. In other words, replicating colors using active light uses additive mixing and passive light uses subtractive mixing. Now to validate if three primary colors like RGB are sufficient, for replicating any color in the visible spectrum, we can do that using this simple experiment. To the left, we have a monochromatic light source and to the right, we have pure light sources which can emit RGB wavelengths. To match the color on the left, the observer is given an option to adjust the intensities of these three primary colors and stop when an exact match is found. But this may not be the case for all the visible wavelengths. There could be a situation where no matter how much you adjust the primary colors that you have to the right, you are never really able to match the color to the left. One way you can match these two is by adding some intensity of the primary color to the left. This is equivalent to having a negative value on the right. Here is how the matching function looks like when we try to replicate every visible wavelength with the RGB primary colors. The negative weights are undesirable, which pushes for a better primary color selection and new color spaces. And here is a visualization of what exactly happens when we try to match monochromatic light with a mix of RGB colored lights. Now mixing two lights produces colors that lie along a straight line in color space. Mixing three lights produces colors that lie within the triangle they define in the color space. This is the basis of color spaces. Now here is a visualization of what colors of visible spectrum can be represented using RGB color space and CMYK color space. To overcome the hurdle of the negative weights, CIE color space is introduced in 1931. Color spaces have also been defined to be perceptually meaningful, like having hue, saturation, and value, which corresponds to HSV. We shall revisit the color spaces when we discuss the color image processing. One of the first paradigms of computer vision was proposed by David Marr. He described a general framework for understanding visual perception and touched on broader questions about how the brain and its functions can be studied and understood. His work was restricted to 3D interpretation of single static scenes. Marr proposed three levels in his paradigm. The first one, computational theory, which describes what the device is supposed to do. The second one, representation and algorithm to address precisely how the computation may be carried out. And the final one, implementation, which includes physical realization of the algorithm, programs, and hardware. Let us look at Marr's paradigm in detail. One of the important contribution made by Marr is the representational framework for vision using primal sketch. Primal sketch is similar to a pencil sketch drawn quickly by an artist as an impression, where the most important features of the image are retained and thus helpful in understanding the image. Vision can be interpreted as an information processing task which requires converting a numerical image representation into a symbolic shape-oriented representation. From the primal sketch, which is basically 
an image with edges, zero crossings and boundaries, a 2.5 dimensional sketch can be obtained which can be used to represent orientation and depth of the visible surfaces as well as discontinuities. And why 2.5 instead of 3D? The truth is, from a single viewpoint, it is almost impossible to guess what the object would look like when we see it from behind. Hence, having a repository of 3D models which describe the shapes and their organization using a modular and hierarchical structure can be of use when we're trying to reconstruct a 3D model from a 2.5 dimensional sketch. We can do that by organizing the 3D model description in a hierarchy where the top level is a model which does not have a component decomposition and describes the key aspects of the model. At the next level in the hierarchy, more details are added to the model and at the lower levels, each individual object's model receives more precise descriptions. For instance, an arm, forearm, hand, and the fingers in this picture. Early research into computer vision resorted to the paradigm of top-down reasoning. For instance, by specifying rules for what an object looks like or watch for its specific pattern. For a few objects in control situations, this worked very well. Imagine, however, trying to describe every object around you from every angle with variations for lighting and motion. It became clear that to achieve even basic levels of recognition would require impractically large sets of data. Alternatively, a bottom-up approach mimicking what is found in the brain is more promising. A computer can apply a series of transformations to an image and discover edges and the objects they imply. The processes involve a great deal of math and statistics, but they amount to the computer trying to match the shapes it sees with the shapes it has been trained to recognize. Then there is this paradigm of three R's which stand for recognition, reconstruction, and reorganization. This paradigm requires us to study the interaction among these three R processes and work towards the goal of a unified framework of computer vision. Lot of progress has been made towards the goal of a unified framework for the three R's of computer vision. For example, recognition of 3D objects benefits from a preliminary reconstruction of 3D structure instead of just treating it as a 2D pattern classification problem. It is interesting to see how these three R's interact with each other and augment each other in solving computer vision problems. Take this example of reorganization assisting recognition using super pixel assemblies as candidates. Using simple vision techniques, we can group similar pixels together and then we can analyze these super pixel regions to recognize objects in the image. Now, let us see an application where recognition assists reorganization. Take this example where images are classified directly based on the image intensities. Then we can apply some vision techniques to localize that particular object in the image. This will be useful when you have to deal with multiple objects in a single image Localization with recognition helps reorganization. For instance, in this image, the pixels belonging to the dog as well as cat are very similar. It's only through recognition that we are able to reorganize these pixels in a better way. Let's look at an example where recognition assists reconstruction. Once we are sure that the object we are looking at is a car, we can create a high frequency 2.5D reconstruction using the 3D models of the car. When we use all these three R's together, we can attain complete 3D understanding, where we recognize all the objects in the picture, we reconstruct the 3D models of all the objects, as well as understand how they are related to each other using reorganization. 
Computer vision concepts can be broadly categorized as low, mid, and high-level vision techniques. Low-level vision constitutes of image processing techniques, feature detection, and matching, and early segmentation. Mid-level vision is where things start to come together, attributing meaning. High-level vision tasks are the algorithms which make sense of the visual content and make computer vision live up to the capabilities of human vision. We shall go over these concepts in much more detail over the next few lectures. But let me briefly introduce these concepts to you. Low-level vision or early vision considers local properties of an image. For instance, this image has several edges. When we move to mid-level vision, so that's where we start to group things together. Preliminary analysis on these pixels tells us there's an object as well as a background in this picture. Now moving on to the high-level vision, that's where we identify what's there in the image. In this instance, it's an aeroplane. Um, when we say no-level vision, that's more about image processing. The low-level vision deals with the pixels directly. They want to, for example, they want to the picture look better. If, the, if your picture is blurred, can I deblur it to make it clear? Um, if it is a small resolution, can we increase the resolution? We call super resolution. And so we can see your face more clear. So those are low level uh, computer vision tasks. In low level tasks, in general, we do not care about understand what is there. As long as can make the image look good, that's good. So for example, for, for many of the uh, camera uh, filters in your mobile phone, they are doing uh, low-level vision tasks to make your picture look uh, better. Um, Middle-level task includes uh, um, more about uh, understanding, but not fully understanding. So for example, middle-level vision tasks includes understanding the motion. So not just the, the, the individual pixel, can you understand uh, uh, how the pixels evolve, how the objects move in a scene, motion, um, including 3D. If you understand uh, what's your geometry, okay, those can, those can be a middle-level tasks as well. Uh, for the high-level task, uh, it's more about understanding. I want to see, I want to know this is object, this is a car, this is a, this is a cat, so on and so forth. Uh, more about to recognize the scene, um, recognize object, detect object, and understand uh, what's going on there. That's more about high-level vision. Research on low-level vision is concentrated in discovering what information about the world can be initially extracted from the image. The low-level image processing techniques involve extracting fundamental image primitives like edges and corners, and performing filtering and morphology, etc. Let us try to understand what an edge signifies in an image. An edge could be formed due to surface normal discontinuity or depth discontinuity, surface color discontinuity, and finally, illumination discontinuity. You need to understand that low-level image processing is not vision, but the pre-processing steps before making sense of the visual world. Look at this image through your eyelashes. Don't they look straight? Well, uh, you'll have to understand that low-level vision processing occurs way at the retina level. So, Processing color, contrast, and edge detection starts in retina. The ganglion cells in retina are sensitive to intensity variations. Multiple studies have been performed in neuroscience to understand what patterns give what response in the eye as well as the visual cortex. This forms the basis of low-level vision where a computer can apply a bunch of filters on the input intensity image and be able to identify the key features and apply that 
for several applications. For instance, here is an example where you apply this filter bank to synthesize the texture that is shown to the left. This applies at a local level, so it works very well with repetitive pattern and it fails when there is no underlying texture like this one. Another important low level vision concept is optical flow. Now look at this image and by looking at the motion within the aperture, we can guess that the object might be moving to the right. But is this the only hypothesis that will confirm with the flow? Let's see. Looks very similar, but let's look at the other way. Let's move perpendicular to the direction in which we, we just tried out. Well, that looks similar as well. And how about moving diagonally? Even that creates the same perception of flow within that smaller aperture. This is known as aperture problem, where motion in a local area of an object may not correspond to the motion of the whole object. Now, how do we extract this motion information from a set of images? For that, you will need a continuous stream of images, like a video, and then you can compare two consecutive frames to get the optical flow between them. Now here are two frames shown in two different settings. The corresponding optical flow looks like this. The car is moving forward, so you have green color shown there. Now, extracting intrinsic images from a single intensity image is a hard problem. It's impressive how human vision extracts distance, orientation, reflectance, and illumination information by looking at a single image. Stereopsis is considered as low-level vision where two images with a disparity are projected onto our retinas and then a preliminary processing happens where depth of the scene is initially estimated. This forms the basis for obtaining depth maps out of stereo or multi-view images. Depth from focus is also considered as a low-level vision cue where changing the focus gives you an information about the scene depth. Texture foreshortening is another low-level vision cue where a repetitive texture can be analyzed to get a perception of depth. Shape from shading is also a low-level vision cue where intensity change and shading is used to get the perception of depth as well as the surface normals of the objects. Although straight edges, curves, and corners are processed at a higher level in human brain, we consider them as low-level vision features. There are numerous robust algorithms that extract salient image features from a given image. These features can be used for several mid and high level vision tasks. A good example for low level vision techniques is the task of image matching. Basically, image matching finds correspondences between two or more images. These images could be the same scene taken from different viewpoints or a moving scene taken from a fixed camera or both. Constructing image correspondences is a fundamentally important problem in vision for both geometry and motion recovery. Let us look at the image matching task in more detail. Here is a simple case of two different images taken from cameras that are adjacent to each other and are on the same baseline. Any feature in the left image can be found 
on the right image if it's not occluded on that straight line. Now, why do we have to match? Visually, we can see that feature matches with this one, but how does a computer know for sure that this feature corresponds to that feature in this image pair? To be able to do that, there are a few basic techniques like sum of square differences or normalized cross correlation of these blocks where an exact match is going to give you a spike in the similarity metric in whichever way you define it. This pixel level matching may not be the efficient way when you're trying to stitch a panorama which has multiple images. For that, we'll have to find the salient features in these images and match them robustly. Now this presents challenges at multiple levels. Let's see the first challenge that we might see. When you try to match these features, there could be true matches or false matches. It becomes very difficult when you try to match two invalid images like this one where low level vision features find matches even for these invalid images. This sets a stage for mid and high level vision processing where you use the low level features to make sense and implement computer vision applications. The two major aspects in mid-level vision are inferring the scene geometry and inferring the camera and object motion. These two aspects are highly related to each other. Some fundamental concepts of geometric vision include multi-view geometry, stereo, and structure from motion, all of which infer 3D scene information from 2D images. Another task of mid-level vision is to answer the question, how does the object move? To answer that, we should know which areas in the image belongs to the object, which is the task of image segmentation. Image segmentation has been a challenging fundamental problem in computer vision for decades. Segmentation could be based on spatial similarities and continuities. However, a static image presents ambiguity, which can be alleviated using the motion information. Let us look at the mid-level vision concepts in detail. It is a general human tendency to group similar things together. There are numerous ways in which we can group things together. Here are few observations made by psychologists pertaining to visual perception. We often tend to use these grouping cues to our advantage by filling in the missing information as well as identifying patterns that are not very obvious without the context. Let us consider this example of grouping similar pixels together. When I'm saying similar, I'm referring to the color. As there are very few colors in this image, the distribution of pixel colors is simple. We shall use LAB color space, which is very close to our visual perception. By selecting the region in the color space, which is very distinct from the other regions, we are able to separate the background from the foreground image. Now consider this example where background and foreground separation is not that trivial. If we consider the boat to be the foreground image, then color-based segmentation may not be a good idea. It would be very difficult to identify that specific region in the color space that would group just the both pixels together. An image can be considered as a connected graph, which lets us use the graph algorithms while grouping the pixels together. This graph representation includes the spatial connectivity as well as the intensity similarity metric, which gives a decent foreground background separation. The technique shown here requires human supervision where we mark the foreground and background and the graph cut is gonna figure out what pixels lie 
in the foreground and background. Now take the example of this artery image. If we would like to group all the pixels that are inside the artery into one entity, graph cut may work, but it may not give you the accurate result. There could be areas in the segmented image that might need further refinement. We could group the pixels within the contour together. For this, we would use the technique called as active contours. All right, so let's move on to a picture where there is too much going on. If we look at the color distribution of this picture, you see that the colors are everywhere in the color space. One way to group similar pixels together in this image is by using k-means clustering. The value of k will be provided and k-means clustering algorithm is going to find those many clusters in the data. Let's see what happens when we apply k-means clustering on this image by using the value 7 for k. Here are the clusters found by k-means clustering algorithm on this image. As you can see, pixels that are very similar in appearance are put together. This sort of grouping is very valuable if you try to do higher level processing on this image. K-means clustering algorithm can be extended to even grouping similar texture regions together. To do this, we could use a filter bank on the image and then cluster the filter responses together to find similar textured region. Here is another example which uses k-means clustering to group pixels that lie on same planes together. If we use k equals to 3, it's going to show three dominant orientations of the planes. You could scale this up by increasing the value of k and trying to find different orientations of different planes in the scene. K-means clustering may not give a good result when applied on images like this, where the boundary of foreground and background is fuzzy. This would require a soft segmentation where every pixel is given a probability as to which region it belongs to. This sort of probabilistic segmentation helps build applications like color transfer, which will make it very seamless. Grouping the regions in the image that have similar optical flow forms the basis for tracking. Hence, tracking is considered as a mid-level computer vision task. Tracking starts with detection. Once you detect your area of interest, you can track it by observing it in consecutive image frames where you could make prediction as to where the object will appear in the next frame. Now, let us look at the model fitting concept as a mid-level computer vision task. After we extract low-level features like edges in an image, we could group the edges based on a similarity metric. Say, do they look like a circle? Model fitting is a very widely used mid-level computer vision task in many applications. The objective of high-level vision is to infer the semantics, for example, object recognition and scene understanding. A challenging question for many decades is how do you achieve invariant recognition? That is, how do you recognize 3D objects from different view directions? High-level vision works for image understanding and video understanding. It works on answering questions like, is there a car in the image? Or is the person in the video jumping? Based on the answers of these questions, we should be able to fulfill different tasks in intelligent human computer interaction intelligent robots, smart environments, and content-based multimedia. Let us look at the high-level vision concepts in more detail. Visual recognition applications, if implemented robustly, 
can open up limitless opportunities. These applications can serve as a repository for visual knowledge and can assist humans using them. So why is visual recognition such a hard problem? Before we delve into that, let us look at the visual recognition techniques that are out there. One of the basic visual recognition tasks is classification, which answers questions like, does this video contain people? Is this a football ground, etc. A slightly complex task would be detection because it has to answer the question of where. Where is the bicycle in this video? In general, rectangular bounding boxes are used to display the detection results. Now we can go a little further and ask what objects are present in a given image. This requires that we have a repository of the objects that we want to search in an image. A very straightforward application of this would be visual search. We can search the images in a repository by using a query image and ranking them according to the similarity score. Now to be able to identify what pixels of the image belong to what object, in other words, the semantic segmentation, it's a difficult problem. It also involves obtaining the geometric attributes as well as the pose information of the object. Now, classifying if an object is a building is a different problem than identifying exactly what that building is. Visual recognition also extends to temporal data, a video in which a given object might be performing a certain action. These actions tend to have a repetitive pattern that can be analyzed to understand what that action is. This might not be as straightforward if you're trying to identify what this person is doing in this video. It's figure skating. And also, here people are clapping, but that's not the context of this video, which makes event recognition a much more complex problem. To summarize, visual recognition involves designing algorithms that are capable of classification of images and videos, detection and localization of objects, estimation of semantic and geometric attributes, and classify human activities and videos. Now, coming back to the reason why visual recognition is a complex problem, there are over 30,000 object categories to deal with. And adding to that, each of these objects varies with the variation in the viewpoint. It also varies with the variation of illumination. These are the very basic problems visual recognition has to deal with. Now, if we go a little further, we have problems like scale, the same object might be present at different scales and the object may not have a fixed pose. In other words, the object might be deformable and the object might be occluded as well. Adding to that, we can have background, which is cluttered or it might look similar to the object. There could also be intra-class variation where the same object has different appearances. There have been two approaches for recognition, model-based recognition and learning-based recognition. In a model-based recognition, we already know what we are trying to recognize. Here, we already have a model for a hand and we are trying to recognize the gestures that are made by the hand with the variations of the pose of fingers. This lets us create applications like this. On the other hand, the learning-based approaches, say deep learning, requires just the image as the input and the deep learning model learns the representation of the object. Now this simplifies 
our task a lot in one way, but it can result in issues like this. If the majority of the training images of wolves consist of snow, then the computer might misclassify huskies as wolves because there is snow present in the background. Instead of learning the subtle differences between a husky and wolf, the computer learns an undesired representation. Now this also leads to issues like this. The visual recognition system can be tricked. Also, there are plenty of open problems in this arena where data from multiple sensors has to be fused with visual information to understand what's going on in the scene. Computer vision happens to be a computer science subject uh, that requires a lot of math. In general, the more the better. You can see all kinds of mice are playing computer vision. Particularly, we, what we really um, need is uh, linear algebra, uh, matrix, for example, matrix analysis, calculus. You need to analyze. Linear algebra is for three division. If you work on three division, how, how we get the 3D, you need a lot of uh, linear algebra because it's a projection from 3D to 2D, and we want to go back from 2D to 3D. There are a lot of linear algebra there. And the calculus, so we need to analyze the image, the video. We need to do a mathematical analysis. So that's a calculus. Uh, optimization. So for computer vision, many tasks, including machine learning, um, they are, in many situations, they can be optimization problem. For example, deep learning in terms of the training is to optimize a highly nonlinear function to make it uh, uh, work. So we, we, we need optimization uh, towards a lot. Uh, statistics, probabilities and statistics. Because in computer vision, the word uh, is in many situations is not uh, certain. You have to use a probability model to model your image, your real world. So those kind of, these four methods are the most uh, uh, common, commonly used tools in computer vision, among others. As a beginner, people may feel uh, there are a lot of math there, uh, but the truth is that um, I really like the computer vision uh, subject in this sense is that for every math, you can find is a physical model in computer vision. You just, you do not learn math for math. Every equation, math equation, for example, you learn your math course, they have a physical meaning in the vision problems. So it can motivate you to think about what are the equations mean, and whenever you solve it, if you already get it, you can see the results. That's more exciting than just to learn a math course, to me. Before we begin our journey into the core concepts of computer vision, it is important to be equipped with several mathematical tools. In this lecture, we shall go over the concepts of numbers, sets, scalars, vectors, and matrices in detail. Through the use of linear algebra and other mathematical models, the field of computer vision has expanded rapidly. Currently, computer vision is used to solve vital problems in a vast array of fields, including medical imaging, surveillance, face and object detection, and identification. The techniques that linear algebra provides for solving complicated mathematical models are essential to solve problems in each of these fields. When utilizing linear algebra to solve problems in computer vision, least squares is a most commonly used tool. Computer vision often deals with attempting to interpret real-world data, such as the intensities of an image. These values are error-prone, causing one camera's interpretation of a scene to appear slightly different from another camera's interpretation. Such is the case for image matching. The singular value decomposition is the most common and useful linear algebra technique in computer vision. The goal of computer vision is to explain the three-dimensional world through two-dimensional pictures. In the real world, most of these pictures will produce both square and non-square singular matrices and transformations. 
Inverting transformations from two dimensions to three dimensions will therefore not be completely accurate, but they can be estimated quite well through singular value decomposition. Calculus is the mathematical study of continuous change in the same way that geometry is the study of shape and algebra is the study of the generalizations of arithmetic operations. Calculus has two major branches, differential calculus concerning instantaneous rates of change and slopes of curves, and then we have integral calculus. As an image is a 2D function of intensities, it is obvious to use the principles of calculus in solving computer vision problems. Computer vision uses derivatives, integrals, and partial differential equations extensively in several low and mid-level vision tasks. Artificial intelligence deals with making decisions in the real world, often in the presence of great uncertainty. We can conjecture that the visual world is uncertain and therefore should be described through the language of probabilities. Several standard problems in computer vision can look up to probabilistic methods for their solutions. An understanding of basic probability theory is critical to the understanding of modern artificial intelligence and related fields such as computer vision. Computer vision benefits from computer science algorithms and numerical methods for mathematical optimizations. Dynamic programming is used in applications pertaining to stereo matching and seam carving. Graph algorithms are used extensively in image segmentation. Many computer vision problems are formulated as energy minimization problems. In this lecture, we shall go over several computer science algorithms and numerical methods that come in handy while solving some basic computer vision problems. Well, right now, there's tremendous activity in cloud computing, computer vision in the cloud. Um, so for example, you know, big cloud players like Microsoft and Amazon offer very sophisticated computer vision capabilities in their, as part of their cloud compute so that beyond just using their computers, you can use their algorithms. And we had a great talk here this week from Chris Adzema of the Washington, Washington County Sheriff's Office, uh, Portland, Oregon. He's uh, an information systems analyst for the Sheriff's Office with no computer vision background, but leveraging cloud APIs and cloud compute resources in a matter of two or three months, he was able to put together a quite robust face recognition algorithm, which his sheriff's department now uses to compare photos that officers get at arrest time to mugshots of people previously arrested, or to, t to compare surveillance photos of people who've committed theft to mugshots, and it's um, already resulting in these um, sheriff's deputies catching bad guys. So to me, that's amazing to think that somebody who has no background in computer vision in a matter of a few months was able to not, not put together a toy application, but put together a robust application that's been deployed in the field and is delivering results. That's quite revolutionary and very promising, I think, in the direction of enabling many, many people to create their own applications. Here is a video tutorial that might help you with the programming task. After you successfully split the image into three color channels, you need to fix the green channel as the reference and try to find the X and Y displacement that gives you the best match between the red and green channels. Now you're gonna repeat the same with the blue channel as well. Make a note of those displacements and separate variables and use a subregion at the center of the image rather than using the whole image. So read through the instructions. Circ shift function in MATLAB comes very handy for you in this programming task. Now let's see how we can access subregions in an image. By default, imread reads the image as a uint8 data type. Now let me show you how to access a 50 by 50 image from the top left corner. You can use the colon operator 
to slice the matrices in MATLAB. Repeat the same steps for accessing the center image region. Now let's see how we can evaluate sum of square differences between two image regions. So let's say A is from blue channel and B is from green channel and those are the intensities that you see. You can do element-wise subtraction in MATLAB by just using the subtraction operator. You need to understand that these values will be of the type uint8 and uint8 does not support negative values. So you need to make sure that you convert these regions into double before you apply the sum of square differences. Now SST is going to be the sum of the squared differences. Okay, so good luck with the project.